So this lecture is about uh, Tibetan architecture. Uh, Tibet, <coughs> today it is um, <coughs> a um, special um, autonomous um, region in China. And uh, so the color, this purple color indicate the population of the Tibetan people who, you know, speak a different language, they speak, speak Tibetan. Um, <clears throat> and, um, but in history, you know, it used to be a very powerful, um, very powerful independent kingdom, especially in the seventh century to the ninth century. <clears throat> so Tibet is a huge land. Um, it has great geographical diversity a great snow mountains um, and um, fertile uh, river valleys. And um, there are nomadic life uh, in the um, uh, Tibetan plateau, but there are also settled life in those, um, <clears throat> in those river valleys. And um, so show you the, the landscape uh, difference, um, you know, those fertile, um, settled uh, region with fertile farmland and uh, animal husbandry um, is very important for the Tibetan people. Uh, the Tibetan uh, yak uh, means everything for the Tibetan people. They rely them on food for clothing and uh, for carry on the you know, daily activity, uh, transportation, uh, so, so they developed over many, many centuries, they develop a lifestyle of their own. And uh, <coughs> today, uh, Tibet practice um, a specific form of Buddhism, which is called Vajrayana. Um, <coughs> you know, Vajrayana, uh, Mahayana, and Hinayana, these are the three uh, major schools of Buddhism in China and uh, and Japan, Korea, um, the Buddhist school is primarily Mahayana, and in Southeast Asia, in today's you know Thailand, Burma, um, the Hinayana or Theravada is practiced, uh, but in Tibet and Mongolia, it is the Vajrayana. You know Vajrayana. As a Buddhist school, um, it's also known as the esoteric um, because they focus <clears throat> their religious practice on uh, rituals. And those rituals are uh, magical. They believe there were, there were magic power. And they especially rely on the direct help of Buddhist uh, deities um, for the enlightenment. And they believe practicing specific ritual, pronouncing mantras, uh, that is sacred words, um, and uh, performing those ritual dance, uh, chanting would help them to connect directly um, with, with Buddha and the Bodhisattvas to help them um, to achieve Buddhahood, to become enlightened. So that's, that's called Vajrayana. And Vajra refer to um, a ritual utensil that shape is shaped like this, uh, which is a symbol of wisdom uh, called a diamond wisdom. And uh, <clears throat> uh, some believe it is a symbol of thunderbolt. Um, and uh, some believe it represent the diamond. Uh, you know, both of them are sharp <clears throat> and enlightening, right, or awakening. They have those sharp, uh, either visually or acoustically. So they rely on ritual um, uh, instead of re reading uh, sutras or uh, meditation. They highlight those ritual, the mat, the magic power of rituals, uh, which might be. Um, connected more deeply with the pre-Buddhist Tibetan religion called the Bon religion, 
and a bond religion um, is a form of a form of <clears throat> kind of a shamanistic practice, uh, sham shamanistic practice, belief in animism. That is, you know, everything has life, everything is alive, and everything can be um, interacted uh, with. So that is called the Bon religion, and the Tibetans uh, accepted uh, Vajrayana Buddhism, um, probably because, you know, before the introduction of Buddhism, there was already a shamanistic Bon religion, and the um, felt a greater um, <coughs> familiarity with Vajrayana. So Tibetan art, um, <coughs> just like the diversity of their life and landscape are also very diversified. They have painting, um, some of the painting are giant like that one that can be spread along um, a, a hillside and uh, some of them are very, you know, um, portable, uh, like those small painting. Um, so these paintings are called a tanka. They are, you know, Buddhist painting, and um, that had um, diverse scale and artistic sc style. Uh, sculpture as well. They have big one for settled life. And they also have those portable one, like like this one, like a portable shrine that they can carry on horseback uh, for those nomadic people. <clears throat> they also have the so-called sutra roller. Um, one of the reason for the concentration on on the um, um, Vajrayana esoteric form of Buddhism is because there was a higher degree of uh, illiteracy. Uh, most Tibetan people were not able to read, so they have those Buddhist classics inside of those barrels, and they wrote it those barrels called Sutra Roller, and they believe um, the rotating uh, equals reading, um, and they can still be enlightened by the um, power of those printed words that were put inside those um, those sutra rollers. Again, there are big one for monastery and temples. There are smaller portable one that they can carry <coughs> and uh, rolling while walking. And the Tibetan architecture, um, their kind of nomadic lifestyle had influenced the style of their uh, permanent architecture. <coughs> for the nomadic people, they live in tent and um, the just to use tent during summer, but in winter, they build those uh, wall around the, their tent. <coughs> and um, um, they have those masonry walls uh, on the base level and pile up those um, uh, firewoods on top of them. So they created those surrounding walls or fences to protect um, their tent from wind or from, you know, hungry wolves. <coughs> and gradually, um, you know, their architecture took that form, uh, developing a kind of a, a permanent architecture using load bearing wall and uh, timber columns and wooden flat roof. And the central tent uh, eventually became um, a courtyard, a kind of skylight courtyard. <coughs> so this is the uh, major form of Tibetan architecture. Uh, I mean, those permanent architecture. Um, and some of them are two stories, uh, a load bearing masonry wall, a timber structure for the roof, and um, a kind of a, a central skylight or courtyard. And then uh, very often they have a, uh, those, those uh, corridors surrounding the entire uh, central void space. <coughs> so this is an illustration of Tibetan house uh, with those skylight and very solid uh, exterior wall 
and all the windows open to the central skylight. The harsh weather, uh, storm, a lot of snow, very cold in winter, gave Tibetan architecture a solid um, exterior look. Uh, windows are tiny and um, the uh, walls are sloping, tapering up, um, bottom much thicker and the upper part much thinner, which gives Tibetan architecture a characteristic kind of letter shape. Um, and that letter shape was not only in the wall, but also in the window frame. So they also designed their window frame uh, <coughs> in the letter shape, which might be inspired you know, by those images on the tent. Um, a square or rectangle became kind of letter shaped um, when the tent is, um, is put up. So the, um, they develop a lot of decoration <coughs> using textile. And here, the window itself is still a rectangle, but they draw, they paint those letter shaped uh, dark frame around it. So the uh, general impression of Tibetan architecture, even though they are very solid, very strong, they give a strong feeling of um, soft textile in terms of their surface decoration and uh, as well as the actual using of textile uh, for decoration. <coughs> um, and they also put those uh, banners on the roof and those banners had magical words printed. So give you more uh, images for the Tibetan <coughs> uh, wall decoration <coughs> and um, the wall are painted with images showing textile. Um, and here, um, there's, there's no um, actual textile, but that decoration obviously is mimicking um, the folding of those um, hanging uh, textile decoration. Um, the roof covered sometimes by metal you know, copper, <coughs> gilded bronze, um, <coughs> also mimic um, the soft textile, like, like here. And um, another image showing those uh, wall decoration. So these colorful decorations are for uh, sacred architecture, like those, the temples and, and the monastery. <coughs> So letter shape is a major motif for Tibetan architecture. In this case, you can see the wall has that letter shape and uh, the text textile decoration as well. And that painting on that wall clearly shows those um, kind of soft uh, decoration uh, of textile and the jewels. <laughs> um, yeah, let's show you some more images. And these are, you know, these are vernacular um, architecture, vernacular houses. <clears throat> and they use a lot of uh, textile to block um, the, you know, the, the strong uh, sunshine in, in summer, the Tibetan plateau. Um, the air is thinner. So um, the, 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 the sunlight is especially, uh, especially strong. So to protect um, human activity from that strong sunshine is especially important. So they use a lot of textile and uh, to give them flexibility um, for the reception of sunshine. <coughs> Roof decoration. Um, another characteristic of Tibetan architecture is the kind of a band, dark band decoration on the upper register of the wall, which might came from the piling of firewood on top of the um, masonry wall um, for those winter house when they were the, for the nomadic people using tent. Right? And indeed, a lot of them were um, wood. So they pile up those wood on top of the wall <coughs> to form a decoration, a, to form a decorative band. 
but eventually it became an architectural motif and uh, the high level architecture no longer use wood, but use just different color band, sometimes use a different um, kind of bricks. The interior um, is dark and uh, the light come from the skylight. So it, it has a strong contrast between light and the darkness. So you have very powerful light um, surrounded by kind of a, an abyss of, of dark, um, creating those um, spatial drama for the interior. <clears throat> and this one gave you a, a look at the relationship between the courtyard, the flat roof, and the wall, right? So that all those windows open to the central skylight and the roofs are successful, uh, uh, the roofs are accessible. And the also, um, for those of vernacular architecture, they actually pile up firewood still around uh, the edge of the roof. <laughs> so this is a plan um, of a Tibetan temple, <clears throat> a courtyard, the main entrance passing through narrow entrance to a courtyard, another entrance to the main, you know, prayer hall, and a statue of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas at one end of the wall <coughs> for worship. And then there are small back chambers, and those are usually for the esoteric deity. Um, so here for the big hall, they have those Buddha and Bodhisattva which is uh, common for all Bud Buddhist, Buddhist schools, um, for Mahayana, Hinayana as well. But in those back chambers, which is totally dark, and uh, they have those um, sacred Buddha, uh, those esoteric Buddha, um, very often <coughs> um, looks almost like demons, <coughs> but those are just a different manifestation of the, of the Buddha. So show you another um, look at the relationship between the skylight and the roof, all right? Inside the skylight is very, very open. And uh, then the windows opened on the exterior walls are very small. <laughs> so another image shows the relationship between the skylight and the solid masonry wall. And notice that band, right? So in this case, it's permanent. It's not uh, firewood anymore, but it it is it became a decorative motif in Tibetan architecture. So the interior light coming from the the, the above and uh, <coughs> surrounding areas very dark and the central area very very bright. Structure, as I mentioned, a hybrid structure with load bearing walls and uh, timber, uh, timber roof um, and uh, uh, hypo style halls, multi-column supporting beams and um, a two story structure allows the opening of, of uh, side windows uh, that would be known as clerestory windows in Western architecture, <clears throat> um, but uh, same is true uh, for Tibetan architecture. So you can see it's very different from the Han Chinese architecture with those sloping roofs <clears throat> and a pure kind of timber construction. Um, there are heavy Chinese influence in terms of the landscape painting <clears throat> in Tibetan wall decoration. So here we have a painting from Song Dynasty China. Here we have a painting um, on the wall of a Tibetan temple. You can see the uh, relationship. <coughs> there is also um, huge Indian influence in Tibetan art as well, uh, especially in sculpture. So this is a sculpture. Um, you know, I took this photo in 1996, and uh, um, 
a monk was sculpting a Buddha um, that looks almost exactly like the Sarnath Buddha uh, from India. Um, that is, you know, 1500 years before, before this one. <laughs> and the Tibetan <clears throat> esoteric Buddhism use mandala to help them with the connection with Buddha. So mandala originally, it means a circle or an arc. Um, it, it has multi levels of meanings. It represents the field, uh, a ritual field uh, or the field of power, but it is also um, a cosmic model representing the structure of the universe um, with a center and with square and circles representing different layers of the universe. So it's also a cosmic diagram. <coughs> when there's a Buddha or Bodhisattva in the center, <coughs> it represents the essence of that deity. And uh, by um, performing ritual uh, in front of a mandala like that, um, they would be able to um, evoke the power of that deity represented by um, by his by his kind of a universe. <coughs> um, so that is mandala basically. It is um, a, a Tibetan um, diagram that were essential for esoteric Buddhist practice. So mandala could be expressed in two dimensional painting, <clears throat> but it also <clears throat> was sculpted in a three dimensional kind of model. And sometimes an entire monastery was constructed in the form of a mandala, like this one. This is the uh, Samye monastery. It was the first monastery with all three jewels, <clears throat> the so-called three jewels in Buddhism refer to Buddha, um, the Sangha, and the Dharma. Buddha is the, the God. Sangha is the, um, you know, the priesthood, um, you know, the church, basically. And um, Dharma represent the law or, you know, the principle for the universe. <coughs> So Samye Monastery, um, it has a circular wall um, and then center you have a square complex and then located on cardinal directions, there are symbolic structures and stupas representing different uh, quarters of the universe, you know, just like what is expressed here. Circular wall, square central building and cardinal directions are symbolized by different color and a different form. <coughs> so this is a central um, structure according to Tibetan belief. Um, the central building of Samye Monastery um, <coughs> mixed three great cultures. <coughs> the base is Tibetan in style. The middle section is Chinese in style and the top section is Indian in style. The base level, there's no question, it's Tibetan. You can see those letter shape, the band, uh, etc. solid masonry wall. The middle section with sloping roofs um, and a pure timber construction um, is also, it's Chinese in style. <coughs> the top is believed uh, Indian in style, probably because of you know, the um, composition of four corner towers with a central tower. Um, a lot of Indian um, Hindu temple and uh, Indian Buddhist uh, temple have that composition, you know, four <coughs> kind of a, a five tower um, formation and uh, which might be why the Tibetan belief this is kind of a essentially Indian in style. Anyway, it's very symbolic. It, it represents what the um, Tibetan believe, you know, 
um, the the nature of their uh, culture that um, <clears throat> absorbed the great cultures from from her neighbors and uh, solidly built upon the um, the Tibetan soil, Tibetan base. <clears throat> this is another um, picture. You know, I like this picture because <clears throat> I like that falling tree, which looks almost like a like an eagle, like a like a bird. Um, and in the back, we have the central building, uh, very concentric, very concentric. And uh, the square and the circle kind of a composition also remind us um, great religious architectures from other civilizations as well. <coughs> um, these are the stupas located at, at different direction, uh, representing uh, different continent according to Buddhist cosmology. <coughs> they were of different color because those directions like in Han Chinese uh, cosmology, also had their symbolic color. It's different from the, um, the Chinese color symbolism as we discussed in the architecture of Ming Tang. In Tibet, those colors are different, but they have the same idea about, you know, different direction is associated with a different color. Now, um, Tibet <coughs> historically was divided into um, four major regions. This is one region, you know, you know, if we consider Tibet as a country, then there are four major provinces. This is called the Wei, and this is called the Zhang. <coughs> and this is called uh, the, uh, the Kamba region. And then the north um, is the Ando region, right? So those four major regions, they have different, um, culture of their own. Um, the central Wei region is like the, um, um, the most culturally advanced and the most popular region as well. The capital of Lhasa is located in this area. And uh, uh, same is, you know, Dalai Lama's palace is also in the Wei region. Dalai Lama <coughs> was tradi traditionally the head of the Wei um, area of Tibet. And there is another major living Buddha, uh, which is called the uh, Panchen Lama, who ruled the the Zhang area. Right. So these are the two major kind of living Buddha system. <coughs> the city of Lhasa is located um, in a river valley, uh, the Yalun Zampo uh, River Valley, surrounded by great mountains, and um, <coughs> the palace and uh, administration center of the Dalai Lama is located on top of a hill. Um, and that is the famous Potala Palace. And uh, it, it, it enjoys the um, high spot of this um, river valley overlooking the rest of the city. You know, like the Athenian Acropolis, it is basically a castle. Um, and, uh, but in Tibet um, here, <coughs> the um, <coughs> politics and the religion were combined uh, into the, the Potala Palace. The Potala Palace, you know, is kind of like the Forbidden City. It has its own wall. It is a city inside a city, right? So the Northern border is defined by the hill and in the back of the hill is is a garden so that is the garden and then um to the south of the hill is the uh, central government for dalai lama um, and then his palace is located in the middle um, on the hill um, the potala palace can be divided into three sections an eastern section, a central section, and a western section. Right. Um, the eastern section is Dalai Lama's cabinet. cabinet. It's that his 
basically central administration. It's the central advisors to Dalai Lama. So this is the kind of a uh, political part of the Potala Palace. The central part is the religious part. This is basically a temple as well as the uh, tomb for the previous Dalai Lamas. You know, Dalai Lama is not a name, it's a title. Um, it's, it lived forever. Um, so the Dalai Lama is uh, reincarnated into, um, into you know, generation after generation. Uh, so the previous Dalai Lamas, they, they, they were, um, their remains were buried in stupa and those stupas were, um, well, they were cremated and they, then the, the remains, the, the relics were uh, built into stupas and those stupas were um, being worshiped inside of this complex. So this is basically the religious center. And, uh, <coughs> um, oh, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. I, um, you know, the Eastern part is the house. I'm sorry, not the cabinet and not the, the administration. That's the house of Dalai Lama. And then the central part is the temple. The Western part is the cabinet, right? The Western part is the political part. The, uh, the government, basically, the central advisor to Dalai Lama. And the Eastern part is the house, uh, the residential part. And then the Southern part is the expanded uh, different ministries, different departments for the Dalai Lama's government. <laughs> so the Eastern part is known as the White Palace. It's painted white. That's the house, um, the, you know, the residence. Um, the Central part is painted red. That's the religious part. The Western part it's also painted white. That's the government. And uh, the whole building rise from the hill and the hill became part of the architecture. And then the other department of the uh, central government spread within that wall, um, spread along um, the bottom of the hill. And behind it is a garden, <clears throat> right? So getting a closer view. Um, so you see the White House, the Red Palace, and the central government. <clears throat> um, in the 18th century, um, the stele um, from the central Manchu emperor in Beijing were um, put inside those small Chinese style pavilions. So there we have those stele um, inscribed in, in three different languages, uh, in Manchurian, in Tibetan and in Chinese. And those steles were kind of uh, sheltered in these small pavilions. So getting a closer view of the Potala Palace. So you need to take those endless staircase uh, up the hill and the zigzag uh, leading to different section. Um, there are two major doors. One have direct access to the white, um, white house, the courtyard in front of the residence and another leading to the religious center on the other, on the other side. <coughs> um, yeah, uh, or, you know, the, the, the open space uh, in front of the the west and central section. And this one lead to the space in front of the central and eastern section. So show you a picture of these uh, steps. And this is the courtyard in front of the White House, in front of the residential part. And uh, Dalai Lama might appear in, at this balcony to address the mass. Um, Dalai Lama, uh, exiled to India in 1959 and uh, still um, is not allowed to return to, to his uh, homeland. <clears throat> so, um, you know, Potala Palace still had that um, 
basic form of Tibetan architecture, uh, central skylight. In this case, the skylight is much bigger than those residential house, but there's a central skylight surrounded by you know flat roof. <coughs> the huge dark band, right? Um, and those major religious temples were topped, were kept by um, a, a, a sloping roof, uh, which would be considered Chinese in style during the Yuan Dynasty. But by the time of the for the construction of the Potala Palace in the uh, 16th century, in the 16th to 17th century that was already fully kind of Tibetan. <clears throat> and uh, show you the, um, the central courtyard and in relationship to the surrounding complexes. <clears throat> the golden roof um, atop the major Buddha halls. So, <clears throat> Um, another very important building in the city of Lhasa is the Jokang. Well, Potala Palace is the um, administration, palatial, and religious center of Lhasa. Jokang is a central temple, and it is very old. It was first constructed in the 7th, 7th century and uh, to shelter a statue brought to Lhasa by um, a Nepalese princess and a Chinese princess. Um, so in the, seventh, in the seventh century, the Tibetan king married three queens. One is Tibetan, one Chinese, one um, Nepalese. And uh, the Chinese and Nepalese princess brought Buddhist statue and they were, um, <clears throat> they were given a luxurious house, and uh, Jokang is one of them. So the heart of Jokang is the seventh century room to shelter um, the Buddha statue, but it was later expanded um, so uh, to a large complex, and it features courtyards um, and. You know, one pass through those many layers of courtyard to reach the sacred heart uh, for the uh, statue. And um, Tibetan Lama uh, perform ritual um, activities by circumambulating a sacred center, just like other Buddhist tr traditions. Circumambulation is very important. So here you are looking at uh, this, this group of monks circumambulating a central statue, which is uh, put uh, in front of a column and establish the sacred center. And they are circumambulating that. Uh, same as the ancient Indians circumambulating the stupa or um, the uh, Han Chinese circumambulating a pagoda. Um, this is on top of the roof um, and uh, those gigantic um, sloping, um, sloping roof built atop a flat Tibetan roof. And they use color to dress not only the timber frame, but also the masonry wall. They were painted with bright red and yellow blue color. Uh, so Tibetan architecture is really co colorful. And those textile allow them to, um, can, to, to adjust the amount of sunshine into the interior. Because this is from interior, this is the clerestory window. <clears throat> um, a detail of the Tibetan roof, right? A lot of gilded um, decoration. And I'll uh, show you some vernacular Tibetan house um, so this is a, this is, this is what I mean, you know, they actually pile up firewood um, or, you know, straws <clears throat> um, on top of their, their wall. And um, this is a, another Tibetan castle that is much, much, much smaller than the Potala Palace, 
but it was the prototype to the Portala Palace. And um, um, this is actually at a location um, of a Tibetan capital before Lhasa. So this is the ancient capital of Tibet. And this building used to be um, the place of the Tibetan kings um, before they moved to um, Lhasa in the seventh century. Um, a village spread below the hill, the interior of the castle with strong skylight. And uh, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm going to just quickly show you this um, city of Shikaze. And um, so I'm not going to talk too much here. Um, this is the Zhang region. All right, the previous is from the Wei region, uh, region. And the Zhang region uh, was headed by uh, Panchen Lama. So this is his headquarter. A lot of temples. Um, and this is another city called Gense. Um, Gense is a kind of a local city, but with very interesting architecture. It has the governmental architecture like a castle. And uh, this is the governmental architecture now ruined. Um, so those governmental architecture are always located on a hill, <laughs> protected by moat. Um, and then there's um, um, <clears throat> a religious architecture that has a very um, unique stupa, like the um, Indonesian Borobudur, it has zigzag um, side and uh, pyramidal shape. And uh, around a central pyramidal earth core, multiple rooms were created that looks almost like a um, cave temple. <laughs> that is that building. And uh, the temple and the stupa. Uh, very beautiful, colorful kind of decoration at the gate. Um, this is another city. So I'm Kind of trying to show you the diversity of Tibetan architecture. This this part is um, at a, a city called Sagya, and Sagya's color is blue. It has characteristic blue color, specific for its uh, religious school, which belong to the Sagya sect of the Tibetan Buddhist school. All walls are painted with blue color and then decorated with white and red band. See the firewood pile up on top of the wall. This is the origin of those, you know, band decoration on the Tibetan wall. And uh, in vernacular architecture, they still kind of form that kind of uh, composition on the wall. <coughs> This is a central um, central temple, Buddha Hall, uh, for the Sakya Monastery. Huge textile. The monastery enclosed by wall. And uh, yeah. So notice those kind of color on the wall. Thank you.